is Heather and my mother-in-law is Sharon. She is one of the most entitled and attention-seeking women I know. I have no idea how my husband, her son, Vince, turned out to be such a good man. That was probably due to his father, Philip, who was a great man and loved me. But Vince and Philip were both doormats when it came to Sharon. Why can't I wear a white dress to your wedding? I am the mother of the bride and should get some attention too. Why do you have to be so selfish and hound the limelight? I should be allowed to wear what I want. That's what my mother-in-law said to me when I vetoed the white wedding dress she was going to wear at my wedding. Sharon had a habit of sabotaging people's big day to get the limelight on herself. When people criticize her, she starts to cry and victimizes herself so that she is forgiven. Yes, she is a narcissist, but she refuses to get checked. Vince and Philip ignore her because they think it's less drama that way. So, Sharon got a free pass to harass me and everyone else in her life. After sabotaging my big days and relationship milestones, she was now attempting to wear a white sparkly wedding dress to my wedding to Vince. Yes, it was from a bridal boutique and yes, she actually bought that thing without consulting anyone. She was not happy when I said, Look, I get it that you are the mother of the groom and want to look good, but the invites clearly say that no one else can wear white, let alone a wedding dress. You are being a bridezilla, Heather. This is no way to speak to your mother-in-law. It won't kill you to have me wear a white dress. You are just scared I will look better than you. This rule applies to everyone, Sharon. You can wear whatever you want, but not white. You need to return the dress and get something else. Vince, will you let your freaking wife get away with this? She is being a brat. To her surprise, Vince agreed with my sentiments and so did Philip. They made her return the wedding dress and get something in light pink. She sulked, but didn't say much. All good, right? Knowing Sharon? Probably not. I knew her well enough to know that she would get me some other way, and I was not disappointed. One day when we were at her house, she pulled me aside and said, I need to tell you something important. It's not a request. I want you to do something for me at the wedding. Okay, what do you want, Sharon? You are going to make a special thank you speech for me at your wedding. I was pretty taken aback by what I had just heard. At first, I felt that I had imagined the entire thing. Did Sharon really just tell me to dedicate a thank you speech to her? Thank her for what? For ruining my big days and trying to remove me from Vince's life? Nothing made sense to me. Sharon freaking wanted a separate thank you speech. I calmed myself down a bit and said, I am not sure I heard it right or understood you properly, Sharon. Would you please repeat that for me? God, I always knew you were a dense, dumb girl. You don't have to prove me right all the time. I said that I want you to prepare a special speech for me where you will thank me for making your relationship and the wedding happen. But that's not quite true, is it? I don't know what you want me to say, Sharon. I think it would be more appropriate for Vince to say these things. Why don't you talk to him about it? I know my son, Heather. He will definitely make a special speech for me. But people will expect that since I am such an amazing mother. It needs to come from you because people won't be expecting it. My friends would be so jealous and everyone would think I am such an amazing mother-in-law. This is the least you can do after not allowing me to wear what I want. There it was. Sharon was back at her attention-seeking shenanigans again. She wanted me to pretend that the whole wedding dress fiasco didn't happen. I was baffled by the sheer audacity of this woman. I had no idea why I was still being such a freaking doormat here. And I was slowly getting mad at Vince again for not standing up for me. Now, here I had two options. One, 
I could say no and give Sharon the space to do something even more drastic as an attention-seeking tactic, or I could agree to her dumb demand and figure out how to turn against her, so I asked her for some time and went back home. For an entire week, Sharon kept blowing up my phone with her demands. I was still unsure about what to do. This was adding just way too much stress in my life and I wanted to scream. Thankfully, one night, Vince noticed these texts and asked me about them. After I told him everything, he was furious. He said, Heather, you don't have to do this. Ignore my insane mother. She doesn't deserve a thank you speech from you anyway. I know, but I'm scared that if I say no, she'll do something even more drastic. We know how far she can go, Vince. I'm just so helpless right now. I keep waiting for her to mess up my day or do something horrible again. I'm sorry, Heather. I never should have let it go this far. I know you have been under a lot of pressure. This is entirely my fault. I don't know how to help you now. God, I am so stupid. I keep thinking she'll change. She won't change, Vince. She needs help. And she needs to understand that we won't be doormats to her again. I think I will go ahead with the speech she wants so badly. No, 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 Heather. You don't have to lie about my mom being awesome. This is just disrespectful to you. Who said... I am going to lie. Vince looked at me confused but soon realized what I was playing at. He asked me to explain and I did. I was a little scared that he would get offended or tell me to change my mind but he just looked amused and told me to go ahead with it. We discussed Sharon a little more and came to a decision. I informed Sharon that I would make a thank you speech for her. The day of the wedding went pretty smoothly actually. Since I had given in to Sharon's demands, she kept her craziness to a minimum. I immediately knew that I had made the right choice. She was really looking forward to the speech after which her attention-seeking behavior would start right back. The reception came to a close with the speeches. Vince did his speech and didn't mention Sharon at all. She looked a little annoyed and surprised at that, but when I started the speech, she looked hopeful. I thanked everyone in my life and made a romantic speech about Vince. Sharon looked bored through it all while the others cried. Then came the best part. Sharon was excited because she knew that this was her time to shine. I said, So now that I have gotten over all the good parts, I will be talking about some unpleasant but important parts of my life with Vince. Sharon has specifically requested me to put this part where I thank her for everything. Like a good daughter-in-law, I decided to grant her this demand. I could see Sharon's face turning sour at what I just said. She could already tell that this speech wasn't going to be something that would bring her positive attention instead of making her feel like a celebrity. I would be airing out all the ridiculous stuff she has done to me over the years. Sharon was looking around trying to find a way to stop me from saying what I would be saying. But there was nothing she could do. Philip actually held her in place and discreetly told her to behave herself. He knew what I was going to do and supported me wholeheartedly. So I continued with my speech. I said, Sharon and I met when I was still in high school. I was then just a teenager who was very impressionable and also wanted people to like me. I went to meet her with a hopeful attitude because I truly wanted to be a part of her family. Imagine my surprise when she ignored me the whole evening and told me that her son would drop me within a month. You could also imagine her fury when she found out that her prediction didn't come true. I kept coming around the house because unlike her, Philip welcomed me with open arms. To be honest, I was sad that Sharon didn't like me. I really wanted her to like me. I did my best to make it up to her. Nothing worked. Instead, as the years passed, Sharon turned into the mother-in-law from hell. She became this attention-seeking woman who was out to destroy my life and make herself be the victim. I almost wanted to say no when Sharon demanded a thank you speech, but then I realized that I have a lot of things to be thankful for. So, Sharon, here it is. 
Sharon, thank you for hiding Vince's car keys and pretending to be sick on our first anniversary. Thank you for fat shaming me on my graduation and calling me an ugly pig. Thank you for trying to make Vince dump me when I couldn't get into my dream college. Thank you for faking an accident when Vince and I had our fifth anniversary. Thank you for insulting me and making me cry in front of my friends at my college graduation. Thank you for trapping Vince by faking a heart attack when we were about to go on our Hawaii trip. Thank you for hiding my engagement ring and praising yourself for miraculously finding it back. Thank you for destroying the cake at my engagement party. And yes, I have proof you did it. And thank you for trying to wear an expensive wedding dress to my wedding because you wanted to look better than me. Well, want to know why I'm thanking you? It's very simple, Sharon. Every time you hurt me and made my day all about yourself, I understood how vain and shallow you are. Dealing with me made me learn to be patient and grow a thick skin. Your antics made me see how weak you are as a person and how strong I am to tolerate you. And all these actions over the years finally made my dear husband Vince decide to cut off for good. I wouldn't have gotten rid of you if you hadn't been so damn obvious that you will continue this behavior. So thank you, Sharon. Thank you for finally helping yourself out of my life. I said that and closed my speech. All the guests were shocked, while some looked pissed. I'm sure most of them already knew about Sharon's attention-seeking behavior, but didn't think it would be this bad, and the fact that neither Philip nor Vince protested also said a lot about what is true and what is not. People were looking at her with a disgusted look on their faces. Most family members were shaking their heads because they knew about her antics already. Sharon found herself smack dab in the middle of the room being judged by people silently. After a few seconds, she couldn't take it anymore and her real demon self came out. She stood up and started to shout at me. She said, You witch! How could you humiliate me at my son's wedding like this? How could you do this? Just how you stole my attention on my special days and ruined all the milestones in my life. If you can do it, why can't I? Besides, you asked for this, Sharon. You told me to thank you, and so I did. Lies. These are all lies, people. She is lying to all of you guys. She's just an attention-seeking witch who hates me. All she said were lies. This is trying to ruin my reputation. My guests already didn't believe a word that she was saying. My friends and even some of my colleagues knew about her antics and some have seen it in person. Other family members already knew her well and some have been her victims in the past. Her own sister especially was casting her some really nasty glares. Sharon was trying hard to convince everyone that, that my stories were fabricated. I didn't even have to defend myself, guys. Philip and Vince stood up for me. They said, Mom, are you seriously calling my wife a liar? I was there when all this stuff happened. I was the one whose attention you wanted most of the time. How can you say Heather is lying? Sharon, you need to own up to your mistakes and take responsibility. Most of the people here have seen your behavior up close. Almost everyone knows that what Heather said is true. The rest you don't know. Know it today. How dare you two take Heather's side? She did all to humiliate me and all you were doing is supporting her. She shouldn't have aired our dirty laundry in front of everyone. She did this on purpose. Of course she did this on purpose, Mom. You are the one who demanded and hounded her to write a thank you speech for you. So she made the best of the situation. She told everyone how your ridiculous behavior helped her. Did you expect her to actually fabricate her stories and make you look good? Sharon didn't have an answer to that question. So she resumed throwing insults at me and demeaning me in front of everyone. She thought that by pointing out my flaws, she would make herself look better. Well, newsflash, Sharon, 
People don't enjoy that shit anymore. What Sharon was doing horrified them and made them madder. Philip and Vince were fuming. Vince said, That's enough, Mom. You needed to shut up or leave the venue. I have had enough of you today. You insulted my wife for years and didn't even spare her at her own wedding. Look what you are doing now. Don't speak to me like that, Vince. Your wife has insulted me in the worst possible way. And you are taking her side. This is unacceptable. She just wants to be the center of attention and put me down to make herself look good. How could you tolerate this, Vince? None of what you said is true, Mom. I have seen your text to Sharon demanding her to include you in a thank you speech. I know you wanted to steal the limelight today. You won't even accept your mistake, Mom. I have nothing to say anymore. I have defended you even when you were in the wrong. I am not doing that anymore. Heather wasn't lying when she said that I wanted to go no contact with you. I am telling you that in person and front of everyone right now, I am done. Now, this alarmed Sharon to a great extent. Her eyes bulged out and she looked like she was about to have a panic attack. I sarcastically thought it was great that she was turning my wedding into a drama night, but I also had some blame for it. What could I do when Sharon was up my butt making stupid demands that would only hurt her own image? Not that people didn't know her real face, but still, Sharon herself brought okay this spectacle. Now, she was not at all happy with all the negative attention she was getting. You win some, you lose some, I guess. Sharon won the attention but lost her dignity and her son in the process. She was still delusional, of course. She said, Vince, you can't just say things like that without meaning it. It's hurtful and horrible and I am not saying this to hurt you, Mom. I'm serious about this. I can't tolerate your drama anymore. I am done with you. After today, I don't want any contact with you. And if anyone tries to convince me otherwise, they will be blocked too. Vince, Vince, don't make rash decisions like that. You can't stop talking to me. I'm your mother. You can't be so ungrateful and abandon me. Oh God, it's not even a full day since you were married and Heather has already taken you away from me. Everyone, are you seeing this? Can you see what a master manipulator Heather is? There it was, the same shit again, blaming me for all the drama my dear mother-in-law brought into her own life. For years, I put up with her horrible behavior because I thought that there was no other way. But now, I had my husband's full support in cutting her toxic presence out of our lives. This knowledge made me feel at least a little better about my situation now. Meanwhile, Sharon's good days were about to end. She was going to face some real consequences for her behavior instead of having people coddle her. And the fallout was definitely becoming even more epic. Vince was almost red in the face from the stupid accusations that Sharon was throwing at him. But before he could get into another argument with Sharon, Philip spoke up. Yes, this demure man who preferred to stay the heck away from his wife and her drama decided to put himself smack dab in the middle of it. What he said was truly shocking. He said, Shut up, Sharon. Just for God's sakes, shut the hell up. Your erratic and entitled behavior has gone on for a freaking long time already. For once in your life, just shut up and stop victimizing yourself. What the hell? Philip? Why are you shouting at me? Has Heather manipulated you too? Oh God, Heather, what is wrong with you? Why are you influencing my husband too? Don't talk nonsense, Sharon. I have lived with you for 37 years. I know exactly how much of a vain woman you are. No one has to teach me or anyone else anything. Everyone here knows what you are, Sharon. Today, you just drove it home that you won't change. Vince says that he is done with you. I support his decisions and have made one for myself. What? What are you talking about, Philip? I am going to leave you too. I will be filing for divorce. 
This is enough drama for one lifetime. I don't want any part of it anymore. You will be seeing divorce papers from me very soon. And you will be vacating my home within this month. Sharon couldn't believe what she was hearing. In one night and within a few minutes, she had lost both her son and her husband. She had in no universe ever imagined it happening. Narcissists rarely think that people will ever abandon them. This woman was all kinds of insane anyway. Since Vince and Philip never really stood up to her, she thought that she could push their buttons and never face any backlash. Well, she was wrong again. My husband already proved that he had a spine of steel, and now Sharon's husband showed it too. Sharon finally realized that she had messed up big time. At first, she couldn't believe Philip's words. She said, You want to leave me over that witch Heather? Over a stupid freaking speech? Are you insane, Philip? No, I am not insane, Sharon. You are the insane one here. I have given you multiple chances over the years to amend your behavior and change yourself. I have lost friends and family because of your selfish and entitled behavior. But I will not tolerate this anymore. I won't lose my only freaking son and my daughter-in-law because of you. Philip, you were not thinking straight. All I wanted was some validation that Heather wants me in her life and is thankful for my support in her relationship. I promise I won't ever do it again. Heather made a big deal out of nothing. Heather, 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 this is all I hear from you, Sharon. All you do is blame Heather for your freaking mistakes. You want to portray this as a one-time thing? You want to say that Heather is the one who intentionally spoiled your image? Okay then, let me prove you wrong. Everyone here who knows us, would you like to remind my crazy soon-to-be ex-wife here of any stories you have about her behavior? I wasn't mad at all. This was the wedding of the century. Almost all my guests who knew Sharon had something or the other to say about her. Yes, they all had some crazy stories where Sharon intentionally sabotaged their big days or exposed her attention-seeking behavior. Family members had the worst stories, of course. I was slowly realizing why the extended family never kept much contact with Philip and Sharon or even Vince. They only resumed contact with me and Vince after we got into a relationship. Turns out they were tired of having to deal with Sharon's behavior, so they decided to stay away. Hell, even Sharon's own friends, whom she made me forcefully invite, had some bizarre stories about her sabotaging behavior. Everyone had a field day reminding Sharon about what she had done. She was overwhelmed and started to cry and apologize to everyone. Philip said to Sharon. Now, do you have any more doubts about why I'm leaving you? Philip, please, I know I have done some horrible things in life, but I will change. Please don't do something so drastic. Vince, please ask your father to consider your poor mother. You are not some poor mother, mom. And no, I support dad completely, so I am not going to make him change his mind. You are on your own. Sharon was stuck apologizing to the crowd while also begging and pleading with both Vince and Philip for forgiveness. The guests were disgusted at her and her antics. She even tried to ask me for forgiveness, but I just moved away from her. In the end, everyone's words became too humiliating for Sharon to handle, so she cried and ran out of the venue. No one went after her. After her departure, our party continued as usual. The reception was almost done, so it's not like any part of my wedding got spoiled. The guests didn't mind the drama, and neither did I. As the days passed, Sharon realized that both Vince and Philip meant every word they said. Vince and I blocked her on all our social media and phones. She was turned away from the door when she came begging and crying for help. Why was she asking us for help? Well... As Philip said, he was divorcing Sharon and making her homeless. The house belonged to him because it was a part of his inheritance, so it was not a marital asset. Philip and Sharon both had jobs, so there is no case for alimony either. Sharon would soon be homeless and wanted us to take her in or something. 
Since she was busy spending her money on beautifying herself, she had almost zero savings and couldn't even afford a lawyer anymore. That made me chuckle a little when I remembered how she always put me down for dressing and living plainly. I guess living in opulence was finally catching up to her. Yes, Sharon did recognize her wrongs, but it was hard to tell. People like her need their heads examined, and we didn't stick around anymore to find out if she did. A year has passed since Philip divorced her, and he is already dating an amazing woman. Me and Vince got a promotion at our jobs and finally bought a new house. Thankfully, Sharon has stayed away from us. Actually, she does call and text sometimes, but we never answer. She has moved in with a distant relative of hers because she was the only one who offered her any sort of assistance. She now lives far away in a different state, and I hope she never comes back. Hello. I'm Macy, a 42-year-old woman who has gone through a lot in her life. Today, I want to tell you about how I became a single mom when my kids were very young. I had met my ex-husband, Harry, through some mutual friend. We hit it off pretty well. He was everything I had ever dreamed of. We both worked good jobs and we were financially stable. While I had no contact with my family, Harry's parents welcomed me with open arms. He checked all my boxes, so of course I said yes when he asked me to marry him after three years of dating. Harry was always open about his desire to start a family. I wasn't the biggest fan of having kids, but I wanted to make Harry happy, so I agreed to it. However, once my kids were born, I knew that I had made the best decision of my life. Initially, Harry was an amazing father and husband. He took care of us, sometimes to the point that he even forgot about himself. I truly thought I had hit the jackpot with him. But then, out of the blue, a couple of years after I had both kids, things started going downhill. He had a new co-worker join his team and they began to hang out a lot. Now, from the start, I did not like the look of his co-worker. That man just looked like a bad influence. My gut feeling was right because pretty soon, Harry was ignoring me and the kids. He would come back home from work and lock himself up in his room to play games. I tried talking to him over and over again, but he never listened to me. We would get into these heated arguments when the kids weren't around. He would complain about me pushing too many responsibilities on him and me being a nag. The thing is, I wasn't asking him to go above and beyond. I just wanted him to do something considering he was doing absolutely nothing at that moment. And then one day, Harry asked me if he could take the kids to the park while I was at work. He had a day off and he wanted to bond with the kids. At that moment, I was filled with so much joy at the prospect that Harry was coming back to his old self that I readily agreed to it without thinking about my kids skipping school. I was at work when my father-in-law, Dave, called me. It was not very odd for me to get calls from him at that time because he would call me to regularly check in on me, so I happily picked up, but he sounded upset. Macy, are you at work? Yeah, is everything all right? You sound upset. Well, Maria and I happened to be on our way back home from the grocery store when we happened to see the kids at the park. Oh yeah, Harry said he'd be taking them there. They were alone. Lacey was crying and Jax was trying his best to calm her down. What? Oh my God, are they okay? Yeah, we picked them up and they're sleeping right now. Do you know where Harry is? Or how long were they there for? Jack said that Harry had taken them to the park at around 10 in the morning and we picked them up around 12. Apparently, Harry had dropped them off at the park and just left. That man is going to get a piece of my mind. If you manage to get through to him, let him know that his parents also want to have a stern word with him. You haven't been able to get through to him? Nope. His phone has switched off. 
Okay, I'll try to get a hold of him too. Until then, I hope it won't be an issue to watch over the kids until I get back. Of course not, honey. We'll make sure they eat too when they wake up. Thanks a lot. I don't know what I'd do without you two. I managed to be kind and grateful even though I was raging on the inside. Once I was off the phone with Dave, I immediately dialed for Harry. Just like David said, Harry's phone was switched off. I don't know how I managed to get through the rest of my workday. I kept making phone calls to Harry throughout the day, but never got a response. Once I was done with work, I decided to go home first. I hoped that Harry was just at home playing some games. I know that it's pathetic, but I still hope that he had only left the kids in the park to play his stupid games. I called Dave and informed him about my plan and he assured me that it was all right. I also didn't want my kids to see me getting angry at Harry if he was actually at home. Harry and I had been struggling for a while, but I didn't want my kids to see any of that. I didn't want them to think that the toxic aspects of my relationship with Harry were normal. When I got back home, I immediately noticed that something was different. The house felt emptier. I had a sinking feeling in my chest. I ran through the house yelling out for Harry, but he was nowhere there. With every room I walked into, the more I panicked when I didn't see him there. I walked into his den in the basement and saw that it was completely cleared out. It was then that I actually felt a huge panic attack coming about. Harry had an elaborate gaming setup and I knew that he would never have moved it anywhere else in the house because we didn't have that kind of place. I carefully walked up the stairs because I could feel myself slowly losing my breath. When I got to our bedroom, I noticed all his clothes that were piled in the corner of the room were missing. I went through his nightstand and it was empty. Our shared wardrobe was also empty. Our bathroom had been cleared of all his products. None of his things were there. He had left us. I was struggling to breathe. How the hell was I supposed to raise two kids all on my own? What about surviving on my income only? If I was to pick up another job, I would have no time to actually spend with my kids. In my panic, I kept calling Harry. I didn't care about anything at that point. My dignity and ego were not going to stop me from begging Harry on my knees to come back. But of course... None of my calls went through and neither did my messages. I must have been blocked. With nothing else to do, I managed to calm myself down enough and made my way back to my car. I hoped that Dave had been able to get a hold of Harry. My heart raced faster the closer I got to Dave and Maria's. I knew I had to put on a brave face in front of the kids first. My kids greeted me at the front door. I hugged them and did a quick once over to check if they were all okay. They looked happy and fine and I felt a little relieved. They told me all about their day and for a second, I had forgotten about my huge problem. Maria sensed my unease though, so she had my kids leave the room to play in their playroom. She went back into the living room with a glass of water. Dave, Maria and I sat on the couch and we began to discuss everything that had happened. Did you manage to talk to Harry? No, no, I don't know where he is and I'm freaking out. What's wrong? I went back home and all his stuff is gone. Gone? What do you mean gone? Gone as in there's no trace that he ever even lived in our home. All his clothes, his toiletries, his gaming things, everything's just gone. You think he left you? I hate that he's done this. I'm going to teach him a good lesson if he does come back. That is not how I raise my son to behave. Do you have any idea where he may be? Well... There are his friends, places, and some of his usual haunts, but other than that, not really. Okay, well, let's start by talking to his friends and then looking around the places he usually visits. If nothing turns up, we'll go to the police. 
I really did not want to get the police involved in this matter, so I tried calling everyone that we knew. I even managed to find some of Harry's high school friends and ask them if they had seen him around. Maria and Dave contacted their relatives and neighbors to find any information. We even went around the city looking for him. During this time, I had to juggle the kids and work. I was lucky enough to get a week off when I explained my situation to my boss. When it came to dealing with my kids, however, that was a lot tougher. I got asked every single day where their dad was and I had no answer to really give them. I would tell them that he was away on a business trip and then they would ask when he'd be back. Thankfully, Dave and Maria had my back a lot. When it got too overwhelming to juggle everything, they took over. Eventually, we did get the police involved. However, they said that they were not going to be able to help considering he left on his own accord, so he technically was not a missing person. Everything shattered at that moment. I didn't know how to proceed from there. Maria and Dave also seemed to be in some sort of trance, just like I was. I remember feeling so betrayed and abandoned at that moment. What happened to all of Harry and I's promises? What about our promise to stay together forever or to raise our kids to be great people or to even go on a date every fourth Saturday of the month? I spent every night crying myself to sleep after that. I couldn't even face my kids because how could I tell them that their dad had run away from us and left us? Dave and Maria came over one night to check in on me and after I had put the kids to bed, I broke down crying in front of them. Before I knew it, the two of them were crying too. We just held each other for a little while until we stopped crying. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cry this way. There's every reason to cry. You've lost a husband and we've lost our son. We get what you feel. Yes, that's why we keep coming over. I guess somewhere inside we feel guilty for his behavior. You have absolutely no reason to feel any guilt. He was the one who made the decision to abandon us and he's responsible for it. Yeah, but maybe it was the way we brought him up that made him. Nonsense. I know you brought him up well because you are here right now. You could have also left us alone since your son is not here, but you've chosen to be here to take care of us and help me out. You're right. We can never leave you guys, your family. Precisely, Macy. I want you to remember that we're family. We want to help you and the kids out in any way possible. Don't hesitate to ask us, okay? Of course. After that, we slowly grew out of the hurt and misery we felt. I managed to somehow break the news to my kids about their father's abandonment. I feel like they had an inkling that their father was never coming back because they were eerily calm about it. They only asked me if their grandparents and I were going to leave them too. I assured them we would never. And that was the first time I didn't feel upset at Harry. Instead, I felt rage towards him. He had shown my kids what abandonment felt like, and now they were going to be cautious about it for a while. But my in-laws and I tried our hardest to do only the best for them and show them that we were never going anywhere. The kids continued to thrive and I began to see them going back to their happy, bubbly selves. Around five years into Harry's disappearance, I stopped checking up on him. I had been religiously trying to contact him up until then, but then one day I realized just how long five years was. Harry had missed a lot of firsts of his kids and the kids had all but forgotten about him. I didn't see any reason to want him back. Ten years after Harry left us, things were going well for us. Jax got into his dream college with a full ride and Lacey was acing all her classes. I was earning enough for us to live more than comfortably. Maria and Dave were practically living with us because they were getting pretty old and we didn't want them to be living on their own. Maria and Dave were struggling with their health, their bones hurt and in general had issues with their blood and sugar levels. I was dreading one of them passing away. They had been my rock during my hard times so I wanted them to enjoy a good time with me then. 
It took years for all of us to adjust to our new lives and I wanted them to enjoy it to its fullest. I guess it came as no real surprise to me when Dave got really, really ill. Maria and I kept taking turns staying at the hospital when Dave had slipped into a coma. It was a hard time for all of us. For a long while, there was no laughter or smiles in our home. However, things changed when Dave finally woke up. He was still very weak and sick, but he was still alive. We were told that regardless of him being awake, he still didn't have much time to live. The entire family spent time with him at the hospital after that. Dave made peace with the fact that he wasn't going to be there much longer. He was the one who uplifted the mood somehow, even though he was pretty weak. He still insisted on me getting his lawyer there so he could rearrange his affairs and rewrite his will. When the lawyer was in the room, none of us were allowed in. Sorry, I couldn't let you guys in. Oh dear, it's okay. Just get your rest in. I just wanted to surprise you guys. That's awfully sweet of you to think about a surprise for us right now, Dave. Of course, you know how much I love surprises. We really don't want this surprise for a while, though, dear. Oh, pff, at least this way there will be at least something to look forward to. I just have one condition for you. What is it? You have to stick to what's written in the will. Promise me that no matter what happens, my estates will remain divided the way I divided them. Of course, dear, promise. I promise everything will be as you wanted it to be. About two weeks after he woke up, Dave passed away in his sleep. I was a mess. He was like a father to me. He was the only man in my life that was there for me and helped me learn and grow. He was also a father figure to my kids and greatly helped me bring them up. Maria and the kids were a mess too. There was so much crying and hurting. All of us had lost someone very dear to our hearts. I had taken up the initiative to take care of all the paperwork and all the funeral services. I knew that Maria did not have the strength for that. The funeral took place three days after Dave passed away. There were a lot of people and it felt good to see that Dave was just as loved by many more people that were in his life. Of course, at that moment, I did feel a pang of anger. I was sure that Harry must have found out that his dad had passed away. I even had Dave's obituary published in the newspaper, but he still never showed up for the funeral. Then again, if Harry did show up, I didn't know how I would have reacted. I guess it was just better that the only people there were the people who truly loved and cared for Dave. The next few days after the funeral were spent grieving some more. In those days, we also got access to Dave's will and we were presently surprised by it. Dave had divided all his estates between the four of us. He gave a lot more to the kids, which honestly I was super grateful for because they needed it a lot more than Maria and I. But he had also left something for Harry. It was a letter. I was desperately wanting to open it and read it, but I knew that it would have been a violation of Dave's wishes because he had made it explicitly clear that only Harry was the one that was going to read the letter. I wish I could say that I wasn't surprised when Harry showed up but I really was. Thankfully, Jax had gone back to university and Lacey had been away at school when Harry showed up. When I saw his face, I was filled with rage. Maria was in the same boat as me. He looked like he was barely alive. He looked malnourished. His bones were jutting out and his eyes were huge on his now small face. He had a lot of muscle before and now his arms and legs looked like twigs. His voice was very raspy and his eyes were bloodshot. I had a very strong feeling that he must have spent the last few years abusing substances. Of course, I know that addictions are a genuine illness that needs to be treated. If it were any other circumstance, I would have empathized with an addict, but not with Harry. 
No, he was a man that had it all. He had the perfect wife, the perfect kids, the perfect house, the perfect job, and the perfect friend. He threw it all away because he didn't want to be responsible anymore and wanted to do substances instead. What the hell are you doing here? What do you mean? I'm here to meet you guys. Cut the crap, Harry. You went missing for ten years and suddenly you want to meet? I know I messed up, but I really do want to make up for everything I did. Right. I don't think that's possible, and you know it. So tell us why you're actually here, or I will have to get the cops involved. No need to be so aggressive. I'm here because I just found out my dad died. Excuse me for wanting to meet my family. Was that what it took for you to come back? Well, yeah, my dad was my everything and finding out that, that he's no longer going to be there just shifted my entire perspective. I feel like crap that I didn't get to spend time with him. Why did you leave then? Because I guess I was just tired with everything going on in my life and I ran away from it. You're disgusting. I hope you know it. Yeah, well, anyways, did dad leave me anything? That's when it clicked in my head. It must have clicked in Maria's head too because we made eye contact with each other as soon as Harry asked that. Harry did not care for his father or his family. He was there to collect his inheritance. Of course I was angry. I was so close to lashing out at him, but Maria held my hand to calm me down. She was right. I knew that Dave did leave something for him and it was not what Harry wanted. Maria walked into her bedroom and retrieved the letter that Dave had left Harry in the meantime. Maria walked into her bedroom and retrieved the letter that Dave had left Harry. In the meantime, Harry and I stood in front of each other in silence. He had this smirk on his face as if saying that he had won. It took all of my self-control to not laugh in his face. When Maria returned with the letter in hand, Harry's face lit up. He almost ripped the envelope with his excitement. He pulled out the letter and began to read. The smirk on his face dropped and turned into a look of anger the more he read. He then looked at me with so much hatred in his eyes and pointed his finger at me. You! What? What did I do? You poisoned my father's mind. Excuse me? He left me nothing, absolutely nothing, and he says it's because you were more of a daughter to him than I was a son. Well, you did disappear for a while. How could he do this to me? Did it not matter to him at all? Of course not. You abandoned your kids, so your father abandoned you. How can you say that? Do you guys not care for me at all? We care for you just as much as you cared for your family these past ten years. Harry was left speechless. He couldn't believe that he would be treated the same way that he had been treating us. Which, in my opinion, is stupid of him. He had some nerve to show up and demand his inheritance when he did nothing to deserve it. He wasn't even there when his dad was suffering. But thinking about how Dave had used the last few days of his life just to write a letter disowning Harry made me feel amazing. Harry tried to make a fuss about it, but Maria nipped it in the bud. She did not listen to a word he said and told him to get out of the house. He threatened to take me to court and get his house back, but I reminded him that legally speaking, his abandoning the property meant that it automatically transferred to me. He had absolutely nothing to his name. Harry looked pale as a ghost while I was glowing with satisfaction. Finally, I got to see Harry in the same position he had put me in ten years ago. I wish that it didn't have to involve Dave passing away, but at the end of the day, Harry got what he deserved and that was enough. Harry left our house and our lives once again after that. He never bothered to contact us again and honestly... We were fine with it because that had been our reality for a long time. Life went back to normal for the rest of us. It was hard to keep going because Dave wasn't there. 
but knowing that he loved us so much to ward off a potential selfish jerk was motivation enough to keep going. Hi, I'm Ella and I'm 30 years old. I have a big change coming up in my life right now, but before I can tell you about what that change is, I would like to tell you about the events that led up to this change. This story has two main characters, my husband, Danny, and my mother-in-law, Kim. Danny and I met through a dating app. At the time that we had met, I hadn't been in the mood to be in a relationship whatsoever. Plus, I had been on so many dates that I had given up all hopes of ever meeting someone to settle down with. But all of that ended when I met Danny. As soon as I matched with him, we started texting, and right off the bat, I felt like there was something totally different about him. He asked me a lot of interesting questions that weren't personal, and in general, kept the conversation flowy so effortlessly. Hell, we used to text until the very early hours of the morning because we just somehow have so much to talk about. When we met in person for the first time, I was worried that whatever spark we had over text would vanish and the date would be awkward. But as soon as I met him, we began talking the same way that we did over text. What followed after our first date was a lot of other dates where we ended up spending hours and hours with each other without ever realizing just how much time had gone by. We dated for around two years before deciding to throw all caution to the wind and get married. I know that dating period was very short, but when you know, you know. We both felt it in our souls that we were just made for each other. Our relationship up until that point had been the most amazing thing that had ever happened to me. There was no way I was going to let that go. We got married with a small and very personal wedding. Only those that were very close to us came. We had a great time until the reception. At the reception, Danny's mother approached us. I was cautious, but she seemed surprisingly nice. Both Danny and I thought that was weird, considering her track record of treating me like crap. But we quickly figured out why she had been so nice. She tried to spill her wine on my dress so she could ruin it. Thankfully, Danny had godlike reflexes and he was able to pull me away before even a drop touched my dress. We didn't say anything to her, but we did quickly move away from her. We socialized with the rest of our guests, but the night did get a little ruined because we had been paranoid for the rest of it. We were worried that Kim would try to sneak up on me and actually try to harm me. You must be wondering why Kim tried to do that. Let me tell you about our complicated relationship. Kim and I didn't exactly have the best relationship to say the least. From the moment I met her, she always seemed to have hated me. And she loved to make it abundantly clear. The first time Danny introduced me to her, she loudly gasped and then proceeded to say that my ugliness took her by surprise. Of course, I knew that I was nowhere near the conventional beauty standards, but to be called ugly outright? That was hurtful. The rest of the time I spent with her, she continued to throw insults at me, and I didn't say a word back then. Because obviously, who would say anything back to their partner's parents? But Danny had my back, thankfully. In the middle of that meal, he got up, paid for our portion of the meal, and grabbed me before walking out. Kim did not take that very well. She blew his phone up with lots of calls and messages, but Danny made it abundantly clear to her that if she did not respect me, he would not talk to her or be in any contact with her. I remember feeling bad about what I was doing to his relationship with his mom. I knew that the two of them had been very close and that she had single-handedly raised him. I had a huge breakdown about it and Danny was there for me then. Did I actually do something wrong to your mother? Did I say something I shouldn't have? Did I dress wrong? No, darling, not at all. I don't even know why she's behaving this way. I wouldn't mind her treating me this way, but it's affecting your relationship with her and I don't like that. 
Listen to me, Ella. Unless you actually did something wrong, I don't see any reason why I should continue to be nice to my mother. But she's your only family. You can't let me get in between that. You'll be my new family then. My mother needs to apologize for what she did. And only then will I be nice to her. You don't have to worry about a thing. Thank you so much for being on my side in all this, Danny. Of course, honey. I love you and you've been nothing but super nice about this whole thing. But you need to stop thinking that you're the one causing all this. This is just bringing out my mother's true colors and I'm not liking what I'm seeing. It was really nice to have Danny on my side. He made sure to reassure me every time he and Kim got into a fight regarding their lack of communication. Kim's hatred for me only grew after that. Over the next few years, she kept trying to hurt me every time we did meet, which was only on holidays. Danny would always be there to stand in between us, but that never stopped her from continuing to try to get her hands on me. Whenever Danny and I tried to talk to her, she would lash out at us for treating her like she was crazy, which we didn't. We simply spoke to her in a calm and gentle manner, but she got aggressive very fast. She never failed to tell us what she thought about me either. She believed that I was brainwashing Danny into pulling away from her. She even believed that I was blackmailing him to leave her so I could isolate him and have him all to myself. Of course, Danny never kept quiet about it. He continued to fight for me and told her on many occasions to leave us alone. He even went as far as to block her on every platform so she wouldn't be able to contact us. But of course, she was never one to leave Danny alone. So she showed up at our house and demanded that Danny speak to her. We had a huge argument at our doorstep and Danny and Kim got into a huge screaming match. It got to a point where... Even our neighbors were tuning into the fight. I calmly and politely asked Kim to leave, and we'd talk about it over the phone when we'd all calm down. Instead of listening to what I had to say, she shoved me aside forcefully and told me to shut up. Danny saw red at that point and called the police. He asked them to have her escorted off our property because she refused to leave. Kim cried and screamed a lot because she didn't expect Danny to call the cops on her. She tried to put her hands on me again because she kept yelling that it was all my fault that Danny had changed so much. But Danny stood between the both of us effectively stopping Kim from harming me. The cops made it in time to see her trying to strangle me and quickly held her back and escorted her away. After that happened, Danny and I decided to file a restraining order against her. It was a tough decision to make, but that was not what we wanted to have happened. I tried my best to be civil with Kim, but she never seemed to want to be nice. We had the restraining order served to her and she did not waste time calling us. Danny set his phone to speaker mode so I could hear what she said and contribute to the conversation if needed. What is the meaning of this? Meaning of what? Of this restraining order. Kim, I'm sure you know that you've been unnecessarily aggressive towards me these past few months. You've shown up at our doorstep and tried to keep assaulting me. So? You are the reason my son has even sent me this restraining order. You poisoned his mind with all these awful things. She did no such thing. You've been horrible to deal with. What kind of son is even comfortable with sending his own mother an order restricting her access to him? What kind of mother tries to strangle her son's wife? Two can play that game, Mom. Stay out of our lives or I will make things worse for you. I'm sorry that it has to come to this, but I promise you, if you make changes in your behavior, we will rescind the order. Wow, you create the problem and then try to get all the recognition for the solution to that problem. I don't want any of your sorry. I will ruin you. Just you wait and watch. That's enough. Now goodbye. It was disappointing to hear Kim still be so rude. 
What would it even take for her to learn to be nice? Every day, I couldn't help but think if I had done something to upset her. Danny and I had multiple conversations about it where we ran back through every possibility, but she literally deemed me ugly within the first five seconds of the meeting and proceeded to hate my guts after. Maybe she was upset that Danny had another woman in his life, which, okay, I could understand, given that it was only the two of them for a long time. But to actively try to hurt me in our relationship was not okay or normal. I tried to suggest therapy to her on several occasions over the years, but she always told me that she was fine and the only thing that would fix her was me getting out of her and Danny's life. Of course, there was no way I was leaving Danny's life, and even if I wanted to, if it was for this reason, he would never have let me leave. We tried our best to be civil with her, but that didn't work either. She took to telling the rest of Danny's family about my evil doings, and he ended up getting a lot of concerned calls. Even though Danny handled the situation, it surprised me to see just how easily Kim managed to convince everyone about what she believed. Either she was a woman of importance in their family, or she was just really good at lying. My bets are on the second one. Anyways, after she received the restraining order, she stopped coming by our place. Although I did catch her loitering just a little outside our house, she would just stand there and watch our house. When you're inside the house and you see someone just standing there staring, you tend to be creeped out. Danny and I called the police several times to deal with her, but I don't know how she even managed to get away from them every time. By the time the police would arrive, she would be gone. Eventually, she stopped showing up and Danny and I thought we were finally free. And then, our mail began disappearing. There were so many things I ordered and many letters I got from my family back home, but never actually received because whenever I went to check the mailbox, the mail was gone. It got really frustrating because I was losing on so many beautiful letters. My family loves the aesthetic of writing letters to each other. And none of what I was ordering was getting refunded considering the drivers attest to delivering the packages. Danny and I had a good suspicion about who could have been robbing us. Kim. We knew that she was bitter and angry with us. Of course, we didn't agree with this method of hers to gain attention because it was something that was causing a lot of losses. But we also didn't want to engage with her. If she thought that this would get us to talk to her, she was sorely wrong. Instead, we bought a pretty noticeable camera that we attached to the mailbox and attached with it a note that stated that there was a camera that was recording everyone who came over to the mailbox. And surprise, surprise, we saw Kim standing in her usual spot and staring at the house when we were at work. Then she approached our mailbox, read the note and turned away. We said nothing about it because at least she took the note seriously. I was at work when I got a call from Kim. Now she was blocked on my phone, but she decided to call my company and have them get me on call. I didn't even want to know how she figured out where I worked because that would have only made me a lot more paranoid. Hi, Ella. Kim, why are you calling me? Oh, I just wanted to let you know about this one thing I did. Okay. You see, these past few months, all I could think about was how much I hated you because of the way you ruined my relationship with my son. First of all, that's very unhealthy. Secondly, I didn't do any of that. You did that to yourself by hating me so much and trying to ruin your son's relationship because of that hatred. I'm not done, Ella. I really don't have time for this. Oh, you will definitely have time for this when I tell you what I did. Like I said, I was so consumed by my thoughts that one day it hit me. I didn't have to get near you to hurt you. Kim, what did you do? Nothing too big for me, really. 
I just happened to walk by your place when I saw your car parked by the sidewalk. I had my keys in my hand, and next thing I knew, I was scratching up your car real good like a mad person with them. Here, let me send you a couple of pictures. I was confused because from where I was sitting, which was by the window, I could clearly see my car parked there. I knew that Danny wasn't home either and we both had distinctly different cars. So if neither of our cars was there, whose car was it and why was it parked by our place? My answers came rather quickly when I received the pictures. Kim had emailed me the pictures considering the fact that she was blocked everywhere. The car was indeed scratched up really well. It would take a lot of money to fix that. But that car was definitely not mine. I took a closer look at the number plate and instantly recognized whose car it was. It was Senator John's car. We had a senator who lived in our neighborhood. He was notoriously known for being able to get away with small things like bad parking, although he was genuinely a nice guy. Everyone liked him and no one really made any complaints against him. In fact, Danny and him were pretty amicable with each other. If there was one thing I did know about him, it was that he took his cars very seriously. That man hasn't had a speck of dirt on his cars in ever. John was known to have fired multiple people who washed his cars because he didn't think they cleaned them well enough. So it was no surprise that he was actually going to lose his mind when he saw his car all scratched up. I was upset that Kim went so far, but I knew that this was going to be her true learning moment. I took a couple of pictures of my car that was sitting in the parking lot and sent them to her. What? Cat got your tongue? I, I really don't know what to say, Kim. Of course you don't. This is definitely beyond anything that you could have imagined. I told you that I would ruin you and this is just the beginning. And, oh, look, I hear the police coming down this way. I don't know how to tell you this, but that's not my car. What? Don't lie to me. If this is your way of trying to make me feel bad, it's not going to work. No, seriously, my car is parked at work. I took a couple of pictures and sent them to you. Why don't you take a look? But, but, then whose car did I scratch? That would be the car of the senator, who, by the way, is very particular about his cars. What? Oh, Kim, if you wanted to cause me harm, the least you could have done was at least check whose car that was. What do I do? Face the consequences of your actions. Take care, Kim. Goodbye. A part of me was excited to see what would happen to Kim. It brought me a certain level of satisfaction to hear her shiver as I told her just whose car she had damaged. I immediately called Danny to tell him about what had happened, and while he was shocked and angry that she had even attempted to do something to me, he too couldn't help but laugh at the way that things had turned out for her. By the time I was done with work, I had received a call from the police station requesting Danny and I to come down. We had our statements taken considering Kim had a vendetta against me. It didn't help Kim's case that we also had restraining orders against her. We were asked about how long she had been trying to hurt me and if there was any particular reason why. We answered truthfully because we didn't have any reason to lie about it. We were also told that even though Kim was at the scene of the crime, she denied doing it. They asked us if we had any security cameras around our home, and I told them that we did have one attached to our mailbox because in the past few months, a lot of our mail had been disappearing. We were asked to submit the footage from that camera, and we did. When we reviewed the footage, surprise, surprise, Kim scratched the car like a mad person. She looked almost animalistic while doing so. I will admit that I did feel a little sorry for her. Clearly, she wasn't doing so well mentally, but to go this far was inexcusable. The senator, John, was obviously fuming with anger. He approached Danny to have a word with him. Danny? You know I think you're a great guy, but this, 
This is inexcusable. Oh, I fully agree with you, John. I don't think what my mom did deserves any forgiveness. Really? I thought you'd try to defend her. She tried to do that to my wife's car. I would have done the same thing you're doing if she did what she intended to do. Why would she even want to do that to Ella? She's a lovely woman. That's what I've tried to tell my mom, but she refuses to believe that my wife is anything less than evil. That's a shame, really. Even so, I'm really sorry for what my mother did. If you need me to cover any of the costs of the car, let me know. Nonsense. I approached you to tell you that I will be pursuing the highest punishment possible to be given to her. She will pay for what damages she did. I just didn't want us to have any hard feelings. No hard feelings on my side, John. Do whatever you think is fair. Senator John was not lying when he said he would pursue maximum punishment. Over the next few weeks, Kim was taken to court and her behavior was reviewed and many testaments were given regarding her behavior. Her crime was analyzed and John's lawyers fought hard for a good punishment. In our state, damage to property worth over $1,000 results in a felony charge along with a fine of above $1,000 in jail time. After some time, finally a verdict was given. Kim was charged with damage to personal property and was fined $5,000 along with two years of jail time. Kim broke down and sobbed as the verdict was given. I once again felt a little bad, but Danny seemed relieved. For the next two years, we wouldn't have to deal with her or her harassment. Kim was escorted out of the courtroom and was taken away. Senator John approached us to apologize again, but we assured him that he had only done what was right. In doing what he did, he also provided us with some peace of mind. Of course, we were still worried about what the future would look like once Kim was done with her sentence, and that worry was rightfully there, considering a few weeks after she spent time in jail, she began to send us letters. In those letters, she kept detailing how she would make our lives hell once she got out. Neither Danny nor I wanted to continue to deal with her, so we made the tough decision to move out of our town. Thankfully, we both always wanted to leave, but we were way too focused on our careers to make a big change like that. As I'm writing this, Danny and I are currently packing all our things to move to Europe, where both of us have found way better jobs. We're set to move in a month and I cannot wait to start afresh. It's going to be hard to adjust, but it will all be worth it in the end. We haven't told anyone from either of our families that we're moving yet. And when we do, we won't give them many details. We can't have Kim finding out about where we are and then harassing us once again. It was a tough call to make. That is, to leave everything we knew behind because we didn't want one person disturbing us. But it's going to be the best decision we've made. I can already feel it. Hello guys, my name's Harley and I want to tell you about my horrible stepmother, Lena. I will be calling her Lena in my story because she never was my mother or even interested in being one. I mean, this is what she told me when my dad, Cameron, first introduced me to her. She didn't do it in front of him, though. She said, I don't want you getting any ideas about me being your mother, Harley. You are just my husband's daughter and nothing else. You are a teenager, so don't expect me to ever slave myself for you. Um, that's okay, Lena. I'm perfectly capable of doing things on my own. I just want my dad to be happy. I won't come in the way. You are already in the way, you little witch. Don't try to be smart with me. I know how to manage worthless teens like you. As soon as you turn 18, I will do my best to make sure you are out of our lives for good. Then... I will have Cameron all to myself. The talk escalated very quickly to Lena 
saying some exceptionally nasty things about me and my dead mother. Yes, my father was a widower and my mom died when I was only eight. I miss her terribly. And it took Dad a long time to date, let alone find love again. That was one reason why I never told my dad about Lena's horrible words or behavior. Big mistake, guys. I should have spoken up because this woman turned into a nightmare after she married Dad. Even Dad was taken aback by her behavior. Lena always targeted me and did her best to turn me out of the house. She made it clear that she hated children and didn't want me around. That was something she never told my dad before they dated. When dad refused to abandon me, she started to find ways to harass me. She used to mess up her food and put the blame on me. She said, Will you look at your daughter, Cameron? Look at what she's done. She has purposefully spoiled my cooking because I refuse to cook for her. She is going to poison me one day, Cameron. Harley, do you have an explanation for this? I swear I don't know anything about this, Dad. I'm perfectly happy to cook for myself. I wasn't even in the house before you came home, and I bought takeout to eat in my room. Oh, God, she's lying now, Cameron. I'm telling you that you need to get rid of her before she kills me. This is just one small example of what Lena has been up to for four years she was in my life. The entire fiasco was over too much salt on her food, which she had added herself to blame me. It was bizarre, but Dad believed me. I had enough proof. Throughout the year, she did a lot more. She got me off the phone connection, locked me out of the house for five hours, took my car keys on the day of an important test, threw away my project that I spent a week making, and much more. Dad did his best to make her understand that this wasn't okay, but she never listened. She would act friendly for a few days before doing something horrible again. By the time Lena was with us for a year, I got a job and started to pay for a lot of my own things. I simply didn't want her interfering in my life anymore. Dad was upset, but I told him that it would be nice for me to have money of my own. I didn't want him to feel guilty. Lena was a stay-at-home wife and considered her dad's money as her own. So she didn't want dad spending too much on me. Not even some of the basics. I tried to be as invisible as possible so that Lena would leave me the hell alone. She never took the hint and continued to harass me. She wanted to keep her word of removing me from her life and the house. But she had no idea what fate had in store for us. The real fiasco happened a few weeks after my 18th birthday since I turned 18. Lena has been in a good mood. She was chirping and sometimes singing gleefully in the house. I knew why she was so happy. She was thinking that she would finally be able to get rid of me. Well, not so fast, Lena. She had no idea that I had heard her talking to her friend on the phone. She told me how she would ambush me and kick me out. I knew her plan already, but she had no idea what was in store for her. So the day I came home from work and saw my stuff packed, I was not upset, but just amused. I said, Hey, Lena, want to tell me why my stuff is packed and waiting in my bedroom? Are we going on vacation? Don't act so smart, Harley. I hope you remember my words. I told you that once you turn 18, I will be kicking you out. Well, it is time for you to leave. Now, I have decided to be a good person and pack your stuff for you. You know, make things easier for you. So, you want to kick me out of my house? Oh, no, 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 Harley. This is my house. And I don't want or have to keep you here anymore. I will deal with Cameron later, but you are leaving for sure. 
Lena had this overconfident smirk on her face, which told me that she was pleased with herself. She had already started to make plans in her head of what she would do with my room, but like I said, not so fast, Lena. Karma is just about to come for you. I calmly took out some documents from my bag and handed them to her. When she looked at me confused, I just smirked and said, I think you need to take a look at these papers first, Lena. I have been meaning to give you this for a while. Thank God you talked about the eviction today. It just made me remember these documents. What are these papers? Why do I need to read them? Why don't you take a look and find out? Lena sat down and started to read the papers that I had just handed her. She started out looking confused, but slowly her confusion turned into shock and then disbelief. She looked at me and then at the papers in her hand again. Then she turned angry. She said, Is it an eviction notice in my name? What the hell, Harley? What is the meaning of this? It means that I want you out of my house in a month. You know the usual thing that an eviction paper means. You, you can't serve me eviction papers. You can't do that. This is my house and I am the only one who can kick people out. Um, no, Lena, this is my house and has always been so. My dad was just a caretaker who held this place for me until I turned 18. Now that I have, it belongs to me. I have just recently completed the documentation process. No, 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 that's impossible. Cameron can't just give you this house. This is our marital asset and he can't give you the house without consulting me. How is this a marital asset, Lena? Dad had this house before you were in the picture. I guess he didn't tell you that... This house actually belonged to my maternal grandparents. They left the house to me and appointed dad to hold the house until I turned 18, which I did just a few weeks ago. No, no, no. You have to be lying to me. This can't be true. You were trying to scam me and kick me out of the house. Wait till your father hears about it. He will kick you out instead. Lena then made the ridiculous mistake of calling my father downstairs. She forgot the fact that she never asked my dad if she could kick me out. I mean, even if the house belonged to my father, she should have asked him, right? She knew what his answer would be, so she went behind his back to kick me out. In her frenzy, she forgot this little detail and decided to involve dad. I'm not complaining, though. It's even better for me this way. Dad came downstairs to check what the yelling was about. He said, Whoa, calm down, Lena. Why are you yelling like a banshee? What is wrong? Why won't I be screaming? Your worthless daughter is making some wild claims again. She's saying that this house belongs to her and she is kicking me out. Harley, what is going on? I need to know the truth. I knew that my dad would ask my side. He's a good father who knows that his wife can be a mean witch. So he always takes action after considering both sides. This is something that Lena always hated. She wanted dad to take her side no matter who was in the wrong. I can't tell you how many fights they had on this. Still, dad wanted to be fair towards us all. That's exactly why he asked for my side as well. I said... Lena called me down and told me that she was kicking me out. She said something along the lines of, I won't allow you to stay in my house anymore. I knew that she was going to do this. I heard her speaking to someone on the phone, so I decided to kick her out of the house instead. I served her an eviction notice. What the hell, Lena? Who gave you permission to try and kick my daughter out? You never discussed this with me. What is going on? Why am I hearing about this now? Lena knew that she had messed up at the moment. Like I said, she was so overwhelmed with the eviction notice that she forgot about being caught. I saw her panic for a while before turning hostile and defensive like she usually does. She said, 
Your daughter is already an adult, Cameron. She had turned, and we let her stay in the house rent-free for a month already. Most parents kick their kids out once they turn 18. We need to make Harley learn to live on her own and become responsible. That's for me to decide, Lena. You are not, and never was, her parent. You didn't even contribute to anything related to Harley. How did you think it was okay for you to decide when to kick out my daughter? You were being unfair, Cameron. All these years I put up with your favoritism because Harley was a teenager. But now she needs to go. I won't let her stay in my house anymore. Who said this is your house? Which deed shows that this house is in your name? Well, it's your place, so I have equal rights to it since I am your wife. So this is my house too. I won't allow Harley here any more. She needs to go. This is not my house, and even if it was, you have no right to it. This is Harley's house and has her name on it. Lena heard that and went pale. She didn't expect my dad to mirror my words and say that the house belonged to me. She was in her own fairyland where everything belonged to her just because she said so. Hearing anything else was nothing short of shocking and surprising for her. She began to cry and said, Why would you say such a thing, Cameron? Because the house belongs to Harley. I'm just speaking the truth. What's wrong with that? You gave Harley your house without consulting me? How could you do this, Cameron? I'm your wife. You should have discussed this with me. I am not okay with this. You had no problem going behind my back and trying to kick my daughter out. Why can't I do the same, Lena? Talk about double standards. And there was nothing to discuss. This house was always supposed to be Harley's. I was the only trustee who took care of the house. Until she turned 18, the house got transferred to her name just recently. Lena now understood that we were telling the truth. Dad even offered to show her the papers in case she needed proof. She was in way too much shock to do or say anything coherent. She said, You deceived me, Cameron. I thought that the house was yours. You lied to me. This is not fair. I never lied to you, Lena. You never asked whose house this was. When we got married, we signed a prenup saying that our personal assets were just that. Personal. Oh my God, this can't be true. You should have told me, Cameron. Now Harley is throwing us out. Look at how ungrateful your daughter is, Cameron. I am not throwing my dad out, Lena. That reward is solely yours. You're the one who won't get to live in my house anymore. I would have considered letting you stay here. I told Dad as much. But after you tried to kick me out, I changed my mind. You are going to leave. If you kick me out, your dad will follow as well. We are a couple. He won't abandon his wife. Now, it was my father's turn to laugh out loud. He already made plans of his own that I knew about, but he was unsure whether to go ahead with it or not. I guess today's events made the decision easier for him. He was about to blow up his marriage and Lena didn't see it coming at all. He said, Actually, no, I am not following you, Lena. I will stay here and take care of my daughter. I have been on the fence about divorce for a while now. What you tried to do today sealed the deal for me. I will be filing tomorrow. Be ready for it. Wait, what? Are you going to divorce me? You want to leave me over your shit daughter? You can't do that. Yes, I can, Lena. You think I was going to forgive you for tormenting my daughter for three years? Oh, hell no. All this while I thought that you might change. I have been nothing but patient with you. But now I know that you will continue to be a toxic witch. I don't want someone like this in my or my daughter's life. Lena took a step back as if she had been physically hurt. 
She never expected her divorce to come so soon. My dad is actually a pretty quiet man who doesn't do anything drastic. This was actually unlike him. He was mad and his facial features showed that. He didn't shout, but his tone gave away the fact that he was very angry. It made Lena even more anxious. She started to argue with my dad and I chose to leave that space to retreat to my room. Dad and Lena fought for an hour straight. It was mostly Lena shouting and crying while my father explained his reasons to her calmly. After the verbal fight ended, Dad came to my room. He seemed a little upset and refused to meet my eye. He sat down and said, Harley, I know I need to apologize to you. I'm sorry, dear. I should have done a better job of protecting you against Lena. I thought that by being fair and avoiding fights, I would be able to make things work. I was stupid and I made things worse for you. You don't have to apologize, Dad. I know you loved Lena and she wasn't like this when she married you. People change and sometimes it takes time to come to terms with these changes. Wow, you have matured a lot, you know. I wish I could have done things differently. I intentionally brought a mad woman into our lives. Well, what is done is done. I forgive you, Dad. You really did try your best. I'm not complaining. Do you want to divorce Lena? I won't be mad if you don't. I would understand. Girl, I'm not living with that mad woman anymore. I'm done. Her true face shocked me way too much to act faster. I really don't want her in my life anymore. Although I must say that I saw this coming. Somewhere in my subconscious, I knew something was up with Lena. That's why I made the prenup in the first place. I was worried that she would jinx your future and make trouble with money. So I thought this would be the best way. See, you did think about me too. You deserve to be happy, Dad. That's all I want to say. If Lena doesn't mean anything to you anymore, it's best you separate. I spent a hell of a lot of time assuring my dad that he is not the horrible parent of the year. In fact, he went even close. He did a lot for me and I knew that. I just needed to make him believe that too. I won't lie guys, I was super happy that my dad was finally getting rid of that crazy woman, Lena. She is not the one for dad and has no business staying married to him. Not after everything she did all these years. The talk with my dad went well and he went to the guest room to sleep. That night, I was finally feeling peaceful, knowing that Lena would soon be out of our lives for good. I was able to teach her a nice lesson that I hoped she would remember for the rest of her life. The real surprise came the next morning when I found Lena trying a little too hard to appear loving and caring towards me. She was in the kitchen, making me breakfast and acting like I was the best person in her life. Even dad was giving her the side eye and looking at me with confusion on his face. When breakfast was over, I said, Thanks for breakfast, Lena, but you don't have to do this anymore. I'm capable of making my own, as I have done for the last six years. Things don't need to change out of the blue. What nonsense, Harley. I'm happy to do this for you. You having our meals together can bring us closer as a family. What is the need for that? We won't be a family anymore. It's just a matter of time now. You should have done this years ago. It's too late now. Oh, come on, Cameron. Don't be so hard on me. I'm trying. I can make this work. I will start being a better parent to Harley. We will be the best mother-daughter duo ever. Right, Harley? I knew what Lena was trying to do. She had been backed into a corner and took the night to come up with a plan. I knew better than to trust her in my life. Looking at Dad, he had no intention of trusting her again either. He only looked at her a little amused. Since Lena was expectantly looking at me for a reply... I said, I don't think so, Lena. First of all, I'm 18 and I don't need a new parent. I pay my own bills and will be off to college anyway. Secondly, you are and never will be my mother. 
That word doesn't suit you at all. So no, Harley, I am not interested in whatever scheme you have come up with. Harley, look, I'm sorry for being so mean to you in the past. You need to give people chances, dear. We can be a happy family if you agree to give me a chance and it will help me strengthen my marriage too. Dad says that you have a marriage within a few months. I don't know what you're trying to strengthen. If it's a ploy to try and stay in this house, I'm sorry to say it won't work. I'm kicking you out anyway. And I am going to divorce you anyway. You have already done the damage, Lena. There is no point in trying to act all innocent and remorseful. I know you better than that. Lena saw that her new strategy was not working. I guess she didn't have anything else in her ammo. She couldn't threaten to ruin Dad financially because of a prenup she signed, so she had no other way than to beg and cry. And she did deliver. She started to cry hysterically and begged me not to kick her out. She also begged me to ask my dad to give her another chance. She then begged my dad to be a little more forgiving. Our entire day was filled with Lena trying to beg and plead with us for mercy. Since me and my dad were both off from work that day, we had to put up with this torture. My dad did leave for a while to contact a lawyer and file for divorce. Lena received the papers within a week. Dad's lawyer had them served. Lena upped her begging and crying after she was served the papers. Me and Dad graciously informed her that she needed to get a job if she wanted a place to live and a lawyer for her divorce. She was convinced that she would convince us to give her a chance. Well, that didn't happen. As the month was up, she was promptly kicked out. She made some trouble when we told her to leave, but after Dad threatened her with more legal trouble, she left sobbing. I heard that she moved in with a friend since her own family can't stand her anymore. As she left, she took the negativity with her and the house finally felt like home. It's been more than two years since the incident. I am now in college, which happens to be close to home. Dad has successfully divorced Lena and is back to dating. He says that he isn't looking to settle again, but just wants some company at times. As for Lena, last I heard, she moved into a flat with several flatmates and is struggling to make ends meet. Since she doesn't have a lot of qualifications, she is working a minimum wage job and just getting by. I saw her at a grocery store from afar. She looked like she had aged 10 years more. Karma had caught up with her and hopefully taught her a lesson never to try this shit again. Hello beautiful people, my name is Lena and I'm here to tell you a brilliant story. This is about how I got my sweet revenge against my horrible mother-in-law, Pam. Let me start with the basics. My husband Keith and I met through mutual friends and got married after dating for three years. I won't bore you by going into details about what a great man my husband is. Well, he is the best. When I met his father, Rick, I knew how Keith turned out to be such a great man. The father-son duo were truly the best, but I can't say the same for his mother. Pam was a bitter and entitled lady who thought that the world revolved around her. She had high expectations from life and wanted to live like a queen. Unfortunately for her, she didn't have the proper brain or skills to make that happen. She worked a small job and so did Rick. They were not rich by any means and lived a modest life. While Rick was happy with what they had, Pam was not. She always had expensive tastes and the habit of looking down on people. She even criticized her husband for not earning enough to keep her in luxury. She wanted the best, but didn't want to put in the effort to bring in the money. Hell, she quit her job after Keith got a good job and expected the father-son duo to shoulder all her expenses while she spent her days drowning in luxury. Did she consult her husband or son? 
Of course she didn't. She was the entitled type who just expected everyone to bend to her will. Here is where I come in. Keith meets me and moves into my place. We both work, but start saving and planning our expenses with great care. Keith stops spending money on his mother whenever she wants. That made Pam mad at me. She assumed that I was taking her money. She once told me, You think you can take my son's money and live a good life? That will never happen. I won't allow you to bankrupt my son. His money is only for him and his family. And you are not his family. I don't need his money, Pam. I already work a good job. I may not be rich, but I am not wanting for money either. Oh, please. I know women like you. You are a useless girl working in a low-level job. Soon, you will be kicked out and will make my naive son your cash cow. I won't let that happen. Well, she couldn't stop me after all. I married her son and made things permanent. She never accepted me, of course. She always made fun of me and my humble lifestyle. She compared us both from the clothes we wore to the car we drove. Now, the subject of the car is very important. You see, three years back, Pam nagged Keith to get her a new car, and he did. It was a decent Honda, but much better than the second-hand beat-up car I drove. Pam always made it a point to tell me what a peasant I was while she was a sophisticated woman. Keith shut her down after she never stopped. I kept my mouth shut because I really liked Rick and I didn't want to come between Keith and his mom. The system worked for us until one fateful night when we were having a family dinner. Pam made a joke about my car again. She said, You know that the other day my friend saw Lena's car and thought it was going to the compound? She was shocked to even hear that the thing was still on the road. I mean, I would never be caught with an old thing like that. Lena must be really desperate if she continues to use it. You were being super rude to Lena, Pam. You need to stop. We talked about this. Don't worry, Dad. The jokes end today. Next time your friend sees my wife's car, she will be surprised. Mom, Lena has booked a brand new car. She will now have the best car in the family. What? Lena's buying a brand new car? What do you mean it will be the best car in the family? Yes, Lena is getting a new car. You see, Keith went on and on about the new car I was getting. Pam's eyes shot into her head when she heard that I paid $30,000 for it. While Rick and Keith were genuinely happy, she looked upset and displeased. Now, let me tell you something. There is this car that I have always wanted in my life. That was part of the reason why I never upgraded my old car even when it was giving me trouble. It was second hand and was barely functional. I didn't upgrade immediately because I was saving money to get my dream car. By the time my old car died, I had enough and more to get it replaced with my dream car. I had been saving for it for God knows how long. Keith was super supportive of me and was also happy that I was able to achieve my dream. So when he told Pam about my latest purchase, he only had happy thoughts in mind. But I was weary of letting Pam know about it. You will see why. This is what she said next. What? You are getting a new car? A car that cost $30,000? Are you insane? Do you think my son's money grows on trees? Mom, relax. Lena's buying the car with her own money. It is her dream car. She worked hard to save for it, and now she can finally have it. That is great, Lena. I'm so proud of you. You deserve it since you worked so hard for it. Now you will have the best car in our family. No, 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 no. This can't be happening. This useless woman can't have a better car than me. Lena, you better go cancel the purchase. You'll be disrespecting your in-laws by making such extravagant purchases. Everyone was surprised at what Pam said. I wasn't sure if I had heard her right. 
Was she really asking me to give up my car because she couldn't afford one as well? Yes, she was. Because she was just that entitled. Rick and Keith were both surprised and uncomfortable. I said, no, I don't think I will be doing that. Driving a better car doesn't mean I am disrespecting anyone. It's the money I am spending. We don't mind, Lena. Pam, what the hell are you saying? She's not being disrespectful to us by buying better things. Well, it is disrespectful to me, Lena. I don't care what you think. You will go and cancel the purchase immediately. If you are smart, you will double the cash and get a new car for yourself and for me. Oh, hell no, Pam. If you want a new car as well, you can go back to work. You can get it the way I did. I don't see why I should be getting you a new car for nothing. Your car is in perfectly good shape. I will not drive an old car when someone useless like you will be driving a $30,000 car. You have two options, Lena. You either buy a cheaper car or buy two expensive ones. I take one while you take the other. You are delusional, Pam. That's not how things work. If you want something, you should work for it. This conversation is getting ridiculous. I think we will go home. Keith agreed with me and we both left the house. But Pam never stopped bothering us. She kept telling me to cancel the purchase or there would be consequences. Now that got my alarm bells ringing in an instant. I showed the text to Keith, but he told me to ignore them. He thought that his mom was just being dramatic and nothing else. His way of dealing with her was to just ignore her or give in to her demands. He was doing just that. But this time, I didn't think it was wise. So I took matters into my own hands and became extra careful. Thank God I did. Pam messed up big time just two weeks after my car got delivered. I was on leave and at home minding my own business. Suddenly, there is a knock at my door. I open the door to find a cheerful Pam walking into my living room. I was confused and cautious as to why she came to see me and why she was in such a good mood. After making some small talk, she asked for some coffee. I went to the kitchen to make it and after a few minutes, I heard the front door close. I rushed back to see what was going on just in time to see Pam driving away in my new car. Well, guess what, guys? She stole my freaking car. It took a few minutes for my brain to comprehend everything. I was in shock. I didn't know what to do. I called Keith and asked him to come home as soon as possible. He told me that he would be on his way. I was freaking out, wondering what the hell was going on. My panic grew tenfold when Pam returned with my car, but it was in extremely bad condition. Then it hit me. Pam stole my car and wrecked it on purpose. She smugly got out of the car and handed me the keys. I was shaking with rage and said, What the hell did you do, Pam? What was that? You wrecked my car. Why would you do that? You don't have something that I cannot. You don't deserve to drive a brand new car while I have to make do with a five-year-old beat up car. I deserve what you have and probably even more than that. So you decided that instead of working hard for it like I did, you would just destroy what I have? You must be truly freaking delusional, Pam. Well, it doesn't matter anymore, does it? There is no need for me to buy a new car. Yours is already destroyed. Now, you will have to drive an old beat-up car like the rest of us. That's what suits you best. I laughed at Pam when she said that. It was freaking hilarious. She really thought that now I would go back to driving my old car that wasn't even in driving condition anymore. How funny. She literally had no idea what I was about to do with the car she had just destroyed. Pam looked at me like I had lost my mind. I mean, I was laughing like a maniac after she literally wrecked my $20,000 car. 
Anyone in my situation would be crying like hell and screaming in agony. Well, not me, because I am smarter than that. I calmed down and went to my car. After taking some pictures of the car, I reached inside and removed something from the rearview mirror. Pam was confused because she saw what I was holding. She looked panicked and said, What what the hell is that? What are you holding? Oh, you poor thing, Pam. Did you really think my world would end if you wrecked my car? Sorry to burst your bubble, but that's not happening. You want to know what I just pulled out? Well, it's a dash cam, Pam. No, 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 that's impossible. That's fake. That can't be real. I checked for a dash cam. It wasn't there before. You really are very far behind on technology, Pam. This one goes behind the rear view mirror. It has the videos stored in a memory card. With this, I will have plenty of proof to land you in jail and my insurance will cover it all. Pam looked like she landed in hell. She was literally panicking and looked ready to faint. For some odd reason, she didn't think that she would get caught. Now that I have threatened to call the cops, she was freaking out. Our little car stealer and crasher was now in grave danger of being arrested. She still somehow was in denial and kept saying that the device was fake. She said, You were trying to scare me, Lena. It won't work. You just got the car. So what, Pam? Do you think I'm a dumbass like you? I pre-ordered the dash cam even before I picked up my car. This car is expensive shit. There was no freaking chance. I was leaving it without surveillance. Plus, I already suspected you would try to do something stupid. I was right. Now that you have messed up my car, I guess we will have to call the cops now. No, 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 you can't do that. You can't call the cops. Pam was visibly panicking and didn't know what to do. I was already on the phone with the cops who said that they would be on their way. Pam stood frozen in her spot looking like a deer in headlights. That's when Keith came home from work. He took one look at my wrecked new car and said, What the hell, Lena? What happened to the car? What is going on? Are you hurt? I'm fine, Keith. As you can see, my car is a wreck now, thanks to your mom. If you want to know how this happened, I'm sure my dear mother-in-law will be willing to give you the details. What are you talking about? Mom, did you do this to Lena's car? Now, Pam was trying to be smart here. She thought that she could use her son to get out of trouble, and she thought that she could change the story and paint me as the villain while portraying herself as the victim. She started to cry very loudly and clung to Keith's arm. Keith looked confused and didn't know what to do or say. Pam used this opportunity to say, Keith, your wife has wrecked her car and is now pinning the blame on me. She knows that I can't afford a car like that, so she's intentionally blaming me. She's telling everyone that I was jealous of her car, so I wrecked it. I literally only told Keith, and I never said those words. I just told him the truth that you have wrecked my car, Pam. Shut up, Lena. I have done no such thing. How dare you accuse me of such a horrible thing. Keith, Lena is threatening to call the cops on me, son. I didn't do anything wrong. She's trying to pass off her reckless driving on me. Are you saying that you didn't wreck my car, Pam? I didn't do it. You cannot prove that I was the one who wrecked your car. Here's where things get a little more interesting, Pam. You see this beautiful dash cam here? It has both front and back facing cameras. Know what that means? It means that it also records who is driving the car. Pam didn't see this coming. She was sure that she could convince everyone that I was lying. As I said, she has been out of touch with the advancement of technology. She didn't even know that double sided dash cams exist. Her expression confirmed my doubts. Pam now knew that she was trapped. 
I was wise in making sure my beloved car was well protected. My insurance would take care of repair costs. All I had to do was file a police report. This meant that Pan was in deep trouble with no escape in sight. She started to tremble as tears started to gather in her eyes again. Keith looked stunned at the entire situation and quickly pushed away from Pam just as the cops drove up to the house. He said 